The maintenance of international peace and security is the first purpose given to the United Nations by its charter. Peace is what the people of the world want the United Nations to deliver. Time and again, the United Nations has failed to fulfill their hopes. And there are many reasons for this. The most frequent reason is failure by one or more member states to respect the Charter. Under the Charter, a state may use armed force only in two circumstances. In self-defense, or when the Security Council has authorized the use of force for a specific purpose approved by the Council. Only too often, member states have failed to comply with the Charter in this respect. They have chosen to use military force rather than to try to settle disputes by peaceful means, an objective to which all states commit themselves when they become members of the United Nations. A second reason for the United Nations failure to deliver peace is that most of the conflicts since the United Nations was established in 1945 have been conflicts within a state and not conflicts between states. The Charter did not define a role for the United Nations with regard to internal conflicts. On the contrary, the Charter says specifically that the United Nations may not intervene in matters which are within the domestic jurisdiction of a state as a civil war obviously is. This is an expression of the principle of sovereignty, which has been the foundation of inter international relations for over 300 years. That principle, fiercely defended by states, has often blocked well-meaning efforts by the Secretary General to prevent, manage, and resolve conflicts. A third reason for the UN's limited success in maintaining the peace has been the inability of the member states of the organization to agree, to agree on what should be done when peace is threatened or is violated. This problem was particularly evident during the Cold War when international relations worldwide were contaminated by the struggle between East and West. For the UN, the end of the Cold War in the late 1980s was a new dawn. The Security Council could at last discuss, in a reasonably impartial way, the action that might be taken to resolve conflicts, beginning with the proxy wars of the Cold War. The collapse of the communist-ruled federations in the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia led, as the, cap as the collapse of empires always does, to a number of wars between and within the successor states. So the end of the Cold War led to or coincided with an increase in conflict, not a reduction. And it placed on the Security Council and other members of the United Nations tasks which they found it increasingly difficult to fulfill. Those tasks led to a very rapid growth in peacekeeping. Disaster struck in Somalia in October 1993, in Rwanda in April 1994, and repeatedly in Bosnia, culminating in the massacre at Srebrenica in July of 1995. The United Nations was humiliated, and its peacekeeping forces were especially criticized for their failure to protect either civilians caught up in war or the humanitarian agencies which were trying to bring them relief. The criticism was unfair because the peacekeepers' mandates did not at that time include the protection of civilians. But the damage to the UN standing was severe. What went wrong? What lessons have been learned from what went wrong? How is the UN placed today, 15 years after the new dawn broke and 10 years after many declared it to have been a false dawn? These are the questions I will address in the remainder of this lecture. The first thing that went wrong was the failure of the United Nations, by which I mean both the organization itself and its member states, for it is they who determine the organization's policies. It was their failure to face up to the problem of sovereignty. As I've already mentioned, sovereignty is a basic principle of international relations and international law. 
member states' sovereign right to block international intervention in their domestic affairs means that at any one time only a small minority of the internal conflicts in the world are available for international mediation. In the majority of cases, governments are unwilling to permit foreign involvement in their affairs. And even when the conflict is be between states, not within a state, but between states, the international mediator has to wait until both of those states give their consent to third-party mediation. I would like to mention seven positive developments and four negative ones before I evaluate whether the UN's role since the late 1980s has been a success or a failure. The first positive factor relates to peacemaking. Central America in the first half of the 90s was a kind of peacemaking laboratory for the UN. The second positive factor is that some progress has been made in circumventing the sovereignty obstacle if the issue at stake is the protection of civilians caught up in war. The third positive factor is that it is now recognized that peacekeeping will not function well unless the headquarters staff in New York are numerous enough and well enough informed to provide the direction required by the personnel in the field. The fourth positive factor is that there has evolved a new form of peacekeeping which did not exist, with one very small exception, during the Cold War. Almost all operations at that time are what is now classified as, quote, traditional peacekeeping, unquote. The post-Cold War innovation was the deployment of a peacekeeping operation after the peacemakers had done their work. The peacekeeper's task then was to help the parties implement the peace settlement they had signed. The fifth positive factor is the evolution of another new kind of peacekeeping operation, which I call forceful peacekeeping. The new doctrine, developed since 1995, is based on the concept of imperfect consent. The leaders of the hostile parties may have given their consent to the proposed peacekeeping operation, but because of weak chains of command, internal disputes, or dishonesty on the part of the leaders, the commander of the peacekeeping operation cannot be confident that he can rely on full consent. The sixth positive factor is that the United Nations has recently developed a new technique for managing the transition from war to peace. This is the establishment of transitional administrations of disputed territories. The seventh positive factor is peace building. Peace building is international action to address the root causes of an actual or potential conflict. It can be done as a preventive measure or more usually after a conflict has been brought to an end. Now I come now to the four negative factors. The first is the problem of resources. As I said just now, the OECD countries, the developed industrial democracies, contribute 93.7% of the costs of UN peace operations. And that means inevitably that they have a say, perhaps the decisive say, in where operations are going to be deployed. The second negative factor is a division between North and South about what the UN's priorities are. There is an unresolved dispute not all, often heard very loud, but it's there, with the developed countries concentrating on the United Nations role as a maintainer of international peace and security, and the developing countries saying, no, the economic and social development is for us the most important function of the United Nations, and we're not happy about seeing the transfer of resources and energy to, 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 to peace and security issues. The third negative factor is double standards. And the contrast between the West's refusal to do anything to help save 800,000 lives in Rwanda and its readiness to spend billions of dollars and violate international law after a few thousand people have been killed in Kosovo is a scandal which has undermined third world confidence in the United Nations. So, I believe, is the current punitive attack on Iraq at a time when no action is taken or has been taken ever 
to restrain the excesses of another Middle Eastern state which has weapons of mass destruction, occupies territory belonging to its neighbours, and is in continuous violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention concerning the rights of the civilian populations in territories occupied in war. And this issue of double standards brings us to the fourth negative factor. It relates to what might be called the ethical dimension of the United Nations. The message of the United Nations Charter is that notwithstanding the sovereignty of the organization's member states, their individual national interests should not prevail over the ethical purposes for which the organization was established in 1945. It is only natural that governments should use the United Nations as a forum for the promotion of their national interests. It would be naive to expect otherwise. But since the end of the Cold War, national interests seem more and more to prevail over the advancement of the collective interest of all member states of the United Nations in creating a more peaceful, just and prosperous world. To conclude, has the UN been a success or a failure or neither in the pursuit of its primary purpose since the end of the Cold War? I would vote for neither, while insisting that the successes have exceeded the failures, that the UN has learnt the lessons of the last 15 years and is now well prepared to fulfil a wide variety of roles in the maintenance of peace and security. The question of the day, to which I do not know the answer, is whether it will be permitted to do so. I would only venture three brief remarks of a purely complementary nature. Remark number one, I would state the obvious. Since its inception, the UN has demonstrated that it was a most resilient and creative organization. Why resilient? Because the UN was not supposed to operate or to function in a bipolar world. Why creative? Because, as you said, that the United Nations invented peacekeeping. Peacekeeping was invented as a kind of quick fixes, but a most creative quick fixes. The problem is that today, peacekeeping is unfortunately in crisis. The UN crisis goes unfortunately well beyond peacekeeping. The UN is in crisis since the end of the Cold War for at least three basic reasons. I don't want to elaborate this reason. I will just enumerate this reason. Reason number one, there is no leader, there are no leaders at the United Nations, so there is no driving forces at the United Nations. The second reason, I would say in a nutshell, the UN is expected to deliver uh, as a police headquarters, but without standing police forces. We and finally, the last uh, reason is globalization. The United Nations is, so to speak, the scapegoat of member states who do not appreciate the erosion of their sovereignty. I am not saying that nation state is fading away. I'm just saying that sovereignty is not what it used to be. And the only place where states can pretend to be fully sovereign is the United Nations. So this is my second remark. Third remark is unfortunately Iraq. I cannot, of course, ignore Iraq. I am really concerned about the fate of uh, United Nations because of uh, Iraq, and this, this war is an illegal and illegitimate war. And we can praise the UN for not having given a rubber stamp authorization for a war against Iraq. But now there is a more thorny issue. It is post-conflict reconstruction. And with post-conflict reconstruction, you have the issue of legitimacy. In order to be very short, it seems to me that there are now three possible scenarios for post-reconstruction in Iraq. And unfortunately, all of them have negative consequences for the United Nations. Scenario number one is that the UN will play a purely humanitarian role, second fiddle, so to speak, to the uh, American uh, occupants. In French, I would say, un rôle de supplétif, mm -hmm. an auxiliary role. The second scenario is a blanket, blanket political role. 
which means American and British administrators acting under the formal banner of the United Nations. And the third scenario, which, let us say, the most sensible one, is a strong, a strong um, interim administering, administering role. And the UN has good experience in the area of international administration. My problem is that in all cases, there is the issue of legitimacy. So to sum up, I would say the problem is not how big a player the United Nations will be in a post-reconstruction. This is not the real question. The real question is how much legitimacy the UN is prepared to attribute to an illegal and illegitimate war. To conclude, I would say that also the United Nations is criticized, ignored, pushed around. The UN nevertheless remains the most indispensable of all international institutions. Thank you.